What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Check the Kick Podcast. You can be found on SureDog.com. And I'm pretty excited, um, even though the MMA, this whole week was just weird from the PFL Wednesday night event to UFC Singapore at 2 a.m. Uh, hope you guys all had a good week. I'm pretty hyped going into this just because I was listening to some music before I hopped on. Um, listening to some Black Sabbath, which got me thinking, um, it's kind of criminal that John Jones doesn't walk out to Snowblind by Black Sabbath, because that would be funny. Um, but we're not here to talk about music. We're here to talk about face punching and fights. And we're just going to go ahead and, and start off the show with the out with the old. Um, people say Max Holloway doesn't have punching power. And... We should probably ask Korean Zombie about that. Max Holloway gets a third round TKO or knockout, kind of causing Zombie to face plant. Starting off with the first round of the fight, uh, Zombie looked fine. Like, he he came out, he definitely seemed to have a game plan of of going out on his shield, and he wanted to fight his fight, and I, I commend him for that there was definitely probably better paths to winning this fight than just going for broke and really trying to get in Max's face. I think Zombie is a very underrated grappler. He had one takedown entrance or one takedown attempt, or it wasn't even an attempt. He kind of changed levels and and Max was just way too fast for him. That was in the first round. Um, In the first round, they released the striking numbers at the end of the first round and the commentary is like, that's a close round, but none of these rounds were really, truly close. Max Holloway maybe got hit with three or four clean shots. Everything else was rolled with. Zombie did hit him with a nice overhand, tried to follow it up with the left hook. Um, sorry, right hook, try to follow it up with the left hook right behind it. Max Holloway was able to uh, exit out. The commentary was like, he's hurt, he's hurt. He was just circling out. It's going to take more than that to really hurt Max Holloway and put him on skates. Um, and there was an exchange where he caught him. He caught Zombie with this beautiful check left hook. It was so fast. Like, you have to go back and, and almost watch it on the replay to see him hit him with that check left hook, counter him, and kind of cause Zombie to stagger back and almost drop to a knee. He was definitely hurt. Um Everything Max was doing well in this fight, he was definitely sitting on his punches a lot more. People are going to say Zombie's not durable, um, but look what Zombie had to go through. He wasn't. He got hurt a lot in the Volkanovski fight, but Max had him in more trouble in the three rounds, especially with the final blow, than Alex. I mean, the fight with Volk, it was almost like Mercy stopped. This fight, I mean, Max dropped him also with a, not even the cleanest one, too. The jab missed the cross behind it, kind of caught a zombie behind the ear a little bit, and that dropped them pretty bad. More towards the side of the head, behind the ear, whatever. Um, really, you know, caused messed with his equilibrium, caused him to roll to his back, and he kind of put his hands up and, and, and um, backed off. Mark Goddard did not stop the fight. He jumps in on a choke. I thought that was going to be it right there. Nope, Zombie was able to battle out of it. Zombie, again, is a very underrated grappler. Good, powerful striker, but he's probably a better grappler in MMA terms, you know, compared to what he can do on the feet. Um, Got back up and really still continued to go for it. Um, Max's body kicks were good in this fight. His jab was good in this fight. The more he started to let his hands go and the more he started to flow, really kind of almost encouraged Zombie to brawl. And Max is the kind of dude where he can enter the pocket and initiate exchanges and hurt Zombie like he did in the first round. Or he can, you know, kind of just keep a high guard, roll with some shots and counter him. He hurt him three times in this fight, including the final blow. The first time he hurt him with a counter shot, check left hook. Second time he hurt him and dropped him was with, again, a one-two, missing the jab, hitting him with a cross on the side of the head. That was him initiating an exchange. And then in the final, in the third round, Zombie just came out and went balls to the wall, threw like 26 punches at max. None of them even really hit clean. He was kind of going for a collar tie and 
Max threw that overhand right, that slip overhand right, where he'll kind of you know change levels and come up over the top. Um, he's trying to. He wasn't really baiting Zombie into pressuring him because Zombie was just willing to do that anyway. Um, through that first overhand, kind of glanced off him. The second overhand, Max missed with the third one, hit him right on top of the forehead here, kind of where the the brim of my hat is, um, and just caused Zombie to face plant. And the replay, I'm surprised this isn't getting talked about, but it was such a, I mean, the punch landed so perfectly. It caused like, I mean, it looked like someone hit Zombie in the head with a hammer. He had a huge gash on his head too, um, that was being immediately addressed by the the cage side doctor, ringside doctor. Um, Max goes, jumps and runs into the crowd, um, embraces his wife and does a big scream into the crowd. And this was kind of one of those fights where you, it's hard to root for anyone. I'm a big time Max Holloway guy. And, and not just because I think he's an awesome dude, but I just think he's a master technician. Um, and, I, and I like stuff like that, but zombie zombie as well. And it, it's hard to really, it was hard to root against either one of the guys. Max was a minus like 800 favorite by the time the fight closed. So he, he was way up on the cards. Um, people thought he's going to be way up on the cards regardless. I was a little bit surprised to see zombies game plan. Like, in a five round fight, if you lose the first two rounds, he was showing that he could land shots on Max, but like every time he tried to ball brawl Max, he would get clipped. Um, Max was able to stay in the pocket, keep in keep a high guard, roll with shots. Um, even the, the counter punch, Max got clipped. And then Zombie came with a big overhand or big left hook as he was kind of going down. And Max had the guard up and blocked that last shot. Max is not the most extremely defensively sound fighter, but he's so damn durable. Just fighting him in a brawl isn't isn't gonna. I mean, even Dustin Poirier had in their second fight, as one side as some people might think it was, Dustin Poirier still was in trouble and still got hit and hurt a lot brawling with max um i i really do think zombie probably should have you know what I'm, I'm saying this but i just don't think there was a way for zombie to win this fight but if you're down two rounds in a five round fight like i was just saying that still gives you three rounds to win like, I figured, hey, man, he should go out there in the third round. I thought he was going to come and really try to press the wrestling in the third round. Um, say he goes out there and presses two rounds of hard wrestling and, and can, can get some control over Max. And then maybe Max is a little tired and then he can maybe he can do it for a third round or make the fight closer on the feet. Something to slow Max down. Um, but again, Zombie's just not that dude. Oh man, I almost knocked over my camera. Um, Zombie's not that dude. He went out, he, he kind of fought the fight on his own terms, even between the the second and third round. Max's corner was telling him on your terms, you know, this is your this fight happens on your terms. Zombie retired. That was his swan song. They they sang Zombie by the cranberries on the way out. He left his gloves in the middle of the cage and you know got down, and it was the camera was on him for so long. It was like two minutes straight of zombie crying. Um, <laughs> and it definitely one of those like thrill and agony moments too, where you see Max run out, embrace his wife, and then you see zombie there kind of crying and on his back, like, like he got knocked the F out. Max goes in, embraces him. Um, once zombies to his feet, Max grabbed his hand. Max is, I mean, if you don't like Max Holloway, like maybe he owes you money from when you were in grade school or something, because I don't know. Everyone loves Max. He's one of the most loved dudes in the UFC. Um, and uh, I'm glad that I'm here able to talk to you guys about Zombie. I'm going to talk about Zombie and I'm going to talk about Holloway. Um, but since Zombie retired, we'll talk about him. Um Korean Zombie is a dude that was really plagued by his military uh, military leave from MMA. 
that that really impacted him for sure. But this is a dude that fought multiple main events over and over and over again. Um, he's not even known as Chan Sung Jung. He's known as the Korean Zombie. I mean, his last two fights, he fought Volk and Max, probably the best two featherweights ever. Um, I, I know people aren't going to like this, but I think as featherweights, as performers, removing the rec, removing their records and accolades. Max Holloway and Volk are better than Aldo. Um, and his, like his, his uppercut knockout of Frankie Edgar was violent. His knockout against Hanato Moicano was, was dope. The knockout loss to Yair Rodriguez was a tough one to see at the very last moment. But the dude's, you know, he's got a tech sub, a Bravo choke over Dustin Poirier, where he hurt him. A lot of great fights. Um, a lot of great fights from Zombie. He he's an OG and he'll be forever remembered. And he's one of those dudes that he's either uh he, you're either on his highlight reel or he's on your highlight reel. Um, if you're one of those dudes, so shout out shout out to him for just a dope effing career. Uh, Max Holloway, on the other hand, um, the recap show that Ben and Keith do. I believe it was Keith that asked Ben, you know, where do you rank Max Holloway as the best to ever do it? Just point blank period. And that might be something we need to talk about a little bit. Let me adjust my camera a little bit. Um, That's something we might need to talk about. Uh, Even though he's lost three times to Volk, like the dude's got two finishes over Jose Aldo, finish over Anthony Pettis, the esophagus weird injury, to Charles Oliveira, the dudes beat Jeremy Stevens, Cub Swanson. We're gonna talk about him later, and it's it's just funny. Like the the dude TKO'd Clay Collard in 2014. He's guillotined Andre Feely. Like, yeah, he lost to Conor McGregor. He was like 20 at that time. But if you look at Max Holloway's record, win, lose, or draw, the dudes fought Conor McGregor, Andre Feely, Will Chope, Clay Collard. Cub Swanson, Charles Oliveira, Jeremy Stevens, Ricardo Lamas in the crazy brawl moment. Um, Anthony Pettis, Jose Aldo twice, Brian Ortega, Dustin Poirier a second time, Frankie Edgar, Volk three times. The fight with Calvin Cater will be forever remembered as probably the best performance in UFC history. The fight with Yaya Rodriguez, brawl. He lost to the third time he lost to Volk. Volk really, you know, was able to figure him out. But then that win against Arnold Allen really showed he was still he's still around, still here. And then this performance against Chan Sung Jung, like that, that overhand right that he just crushed Zombie with. Um, you watch his feet. His feet are planted. He cuts the angle perfect and it just delivers a beautiful finishing blow. Again, drop zombie, makes him bounce off the canvas. And uh Shout out to both of these guys. This was just a veteran ass fight, OG fight. Max is a young OG, young veteran, but I mean, both of these guys are OGs. Shout out to Zombie, great career, kind of a holding place fight for Max. Zombie called him out after his win over Dan Ige. Holloway obliged. I don't know what the hell Holloway is going to do next. He's a guy where he's getting to the point, and I have the same problem with Dustin Poirier where I watch them fight and I like them so much that I don't like watching them in fights anymore where they're like taking damage. Like I love Justin Gaethje too. It was just hard for me to watch him head kick Poirier. Um, So maybe Max can get a little revenge and go up and fight for the BMF belt. Um, I think that'd be dope, but I don't know if I want to see Max Max get punched in the face by Justin Gaethje. Um, Or you can just hang out and fight once a year for the next year or so and not accrue any more damage than the guy already has. And and maybe he can wait out Volk. I don't know. Or maybe the division catches up either way. Shout out to those guys. Dope ass fight. Shout out to Holloway. Um, and they got 50 grand for it. Both of them made 50 K zombie goes out on a loss with an, but has 50 G's in his bank account, including his fight money. Uh, moving down to, we're not going to talk about the Anthony Smith fight. Just real quick, Ryan Span, that was a big lapse of fight IQ. Moving down to uh, Blanchfield. 
Blanchfield versus Tyler Santos. Uh, Blanchfield goes 0 for 14 on takedowns, but still gets the win. Um, and she's 24, guys. Like, y'all, we need to remember that she is only 24 years old. She's definitely going to eventually come to, you know, there's going to come to a point where she's just going to fight someone that's too much of an athlete. And I thought Tyler Santos might have been that one, um, but she wasn't. Blanchfield came out here, kind of got pieced up in the first round, um, got bloodied up, was not deterred. And came out and was able to, you know, get on the front foot, stick a jab on Santos, was snapping her head back with jabs, especially through the third round, um, able to get clinch positions. Blanchfield is strong. Santos clearly is the bigger woman. I thought Santos was going to be physically strong. My God, go to go to Tyler Santos' Instagram page. Look how built she is. She is in incredible shape. Um, kind, kind of gassed out here. There was some, I heard some like weird rumblings about some potential legal issues with her other camp and whatever, whatever. Um, and even though Blanchfield went over 14 on takedowns, she still won this fight. And Santos had no grappling to give her. But look at the fight with Santos and Valentina. Santos had a lot more success grappling with Valentina Shevchenko than she did with Blanchfield. Blanchfield is still going to be a problem. She is a girl that is, she's such a determined fighter. I think her determination is her number one um, strong suit. I, I really think that she might not have all the tools. She's she doesn't have all the tools, but she knows what to do to win. She it's it's like uh, you know if you're if you're building something and you don't have all the right tools, but you you got this one hammer that you can you know yeah you're not supposed to do that with a hammer, but you can still get the job done. That's Aaron Blanchfield. You know she's she's got all the right ideas, the right applications. Um, with maybe just not the best tool. And she was just able to hang tough. And if this fight went two more rounds, maybe she was going to get those takedowns. Um, she was getting entries, but she just she just tries to get these like body lock takedowns in. Um, and I she's still young. She she could she should go back and learn from this, and she can go back and learn from this. I think. I really do think that she will be able to go and learn, hey, maybe she goes out to like AKA or like a, a big time wrestling camp and really, you know, hones that tool. If she can get like a chain wrestling single leg game or even like a, or even like an Aljamain Sterling type of like weird, cause she she could hold Santos against the cage and have a lot of control there if she wanted to. Um, she's tough as shit maybe some you know maybe a, a back taking entanglement type game blanchfield can develop i keep hitting my camera um either way good win for her she called for a title shot um here in probably about 30 minutes or so we'll be talking about a, a the flyweight division a little bit more um yeah whatever I was really thinking about this today and I'm really starting to be distaste. I'm, I'm starting to just have a bad taste in my mouth about these like immediate rematches. And I really think they just hold up the division. Like if you're not out there, you're not winning the belt. And even the champ, like if you are the champ and you're as good as it doesn't matter how long you've been around for, like go out there, win a number one contender fight, give someone else the opportunity to show that, you know, they are better than you. And if you are truly the champ and you're as good as you say you are, then you should be able to beat the number one contender. Uh, don't love that Shevchenko and Grasso are immediately running it back or, you know, even like Pereira and Izzy, just whatever. Um, either way, um, I, I, after the flyweight fight, it's coming up here very soon, Shevchenko and Grasso, I think Blanchfield can potentially face the winner of that. Really depends on that Manon Furo and Rose fight. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Blanchfield's young. She's going out there and, you know, beating the person that had the closest fight with Shevchenko before Grosso came around. And yeah, we just have to kind of see what happens. Um, 
great win for her. And she's not earning any fans with that, but she's definitely showing people like, hey, even if I'm even if I can't get the takedown, I still have the right idea and I can still go and win a fight. Moving on to the final fight we're going to talk about over this past week slash weekend. We're done with UFC Singapore. A lot of dope fights. Shout out to Michelle Olajechuk knocking out Chidi and Jaquani. That was dope as hell. A lot of really cool fights on that card. Pretty entertaining. Um, Billy Goff got a great win. Um, we're going to move over to the PFL from last Wednesday night with, I mean, sure dog slack guys were in there. I believe it might've been Jay Petri or Ben saying that they're going to drop this in for fight of the year. Clay Collard beating Shane Burgos in a semi close fight. Um, this fight was actually dope as fuck. Um, for, First off, PFO, what the hell are you guys doing putting a show on on Wednesday? Uh, it, it, I'm not going to trip. Like, I'm happy that you guys are doing it. But um, <laughs> the Contender Series is on Tuesday. I make sure, obviously, you know, here, look where I am right now. Obviously, I'm watching the Contender Series every Tuesday. But Contender Series, then that, when am I supposed to go fishing? Guys, my Saturdays are taken up by the UFC. Stop throwing so much at me. Do it on Friday night when I'm sitting on the couch. Um, yeah, Clay Collard came out and really showed his volume, his power, hurting Shane Burgos, dropping him. Um, and his boxing, like Clay Collard was known through the pandemic for, for boxing a lot. It's crazy. I think it was like on uh, Christmas Eve or Christmas night, maybe whatever boxing they do their Christmas night show. I think it's Christmas, the night of Christmas. My uncle and I are, are sitting in a shop. He has a really cool bar, whatever. We're just chilling. Um, and he throws the one of the TVs on in his bar area and it's boxing. He, my uncle doesn't know a ton about combat sports, but he knows that I do this and he knows I'm a fan. So he throws boxing on and I'm like, yeah, it's Clay Collard. He got knocked out by some Cuban dude. Um, but yeah, <laughs> he was known for boxing a ton and he showed in this fight. Um, his hands, his his body punching was just chef's kiss he has no head movement but he will throw volume he he was just like the the lost diaz brother in this fight not addressing leg kicks at all and and clay collard has had that problem in previous fights where other opponents have been able to chew him up with leg kicks um and burgos is not the most defensively sound dude either he's just there to have a fun fight um well this was his funnest fight of of his pfl run but a big win to the Idaho native Clay Collard. He he just went out there and put the volume on him. His body punching was great. His straight punches were great. His counter check hooks were great. Burgos was just really chipping away on, on leg kicks. Clay Collard is really durable to the head. He's a guy that's hard to hurt, especially up at 155. He looked pretty small as a 55er. I've seen his body kind of do some different tra transformations. Definitely doesn't look like he's on PEDs. Um, I'm not going to say that he looks soft in the body and the belly either, um, but he could probably stand to maybe even fight at 45. His durability may be, you know, impacted by a move down. Funny because Burgos is a guy that fought at 45 in the UFC. Obviously, a lot of these dudes that are fighting the lower weight classes come to PFL and they bump one weight class up just because the fights are, you know, so close together. And Burgos looked okay. Um, he got hurt, got stung up, stayed tough. Um, eventually had Clay Collard limping, hurt, just crush him with the leg kicks. The leg kicks definitely stacked up. If this fight went two more rounds, who knows what would have happened. Um, another thing you can, you know, a Shane Burgos fan would probably say, if this fight was five rounds, he was going to finish Clay Collard. Clay Collard also might have had a different game plan and maybe would have sooner addressed the, you know, the kicks. He needs to check the kick. That's what you need to learn how to do. Clay Collard, but you're still dope as hell. Um, and now he's moving on to the finals to fight Olivier Aubon Mercier. I think I nailed that. Bunch of French people on the card this weekend that we're talking about. Um, so I think I nailed that. Um, OAM is probably going to beat him. 
Um, OAM also had a really, really great performance this past weekend, um, knocking knocking his opponent out. He was, you know, his opponent was clearly overmatched. Either way, they're moving on to the finals. They're going to fight for a million bones. Um, you know, OAM is probably like a minus 400 favorite over Clay Collard. But still, I'm glad to see Clay Collard here because he's just kind of been a PFL OG. Um, and he's just fun as hell. Like, I went to his social media and he's got like 5,000 followers. Like, I should not have more followers on social media, on Instagram, not Twitter, than Clay Collard. Like, Clay Collard's dope. He's fun as hell. He's putting on great fights. Um, and shout out to Shane Burgos. I am a little bit confused. Shane Burgos is now out of the... He, he's lost two of his three PFL fights. Um, he got slid in... Slid into this... Uh, slid back in to the their Grand Prix or whatever their... I'm calling it a Grand Prix, their tournament. He got slid back into the tournament on some shady BS by the PFL. You guys can go look that up. I don't even want to talk about it. Um, bullshit either way. And he got beaten, and now he's out of the tournament for good. Uh, a little bit surprised. Like, if you go to, if you're, um, I won't judge you on how you watch your fights, but if you are an ESPN Plus subscriber and you go log into ESPN Plus, do it on your mobile device, do it on your TV. Go into MMA, click into the MMA section, and like every little icon for the PFL has got Shane Burgos on it. I don't see it. Shane Burgos is a fun fighter. I don't know why he's like the face of the PFL. Um, because I, I mean, like look at Henan Fierro. Like I don't know. I mean, it's just kind of it's a little lame for the PFL to be taking the UFC's hand-me-downs and flaunting them like they're something extremely special in my opinion. I think the PFL should be even though Larissa Pacheco has fought in the UFC, I think she should like be the face of their organization now that Kayla Harrison is gone or maybe some other homegrown talent. PFL is doing some cool shit. They've signed Clarissa Shields and a bunch of you know a bunch of stuff and they they parade their people around they're definitely hemorrhaging money but um yeah they put on a cool event uh this past wednesday with, with a damn good fight it's too bad they don't allow elbows they should probably be allowing i know that i know they don't allow elbows because they don't want people to get cut open really bad you know whatever but look what max the korean zombie he blew his head up with a punch um but yeah, shout out, shout out to PFL. That was that was really cool. Um, Wednesday night action and and a great fight by Clay Collard and Shane Burgos. And shout out to Clay Collard for for winning a impressive ass fight. All right, guys, moving on to the second segment of the show called "What's Hot." Here to talk to you guys about a hot topic this week in MMA, and the topic is a bonus fight. We're gonna skip what's hot. Just because I'm, it's not a lot going on in MMA this week. Um, yeah, Conor McGregor might be fighting Michael Chandler, whatever. We, I'm tired of talking about that. We're going to talk about Clayton Rodriguez versus Farid Basharat. And what might end up being the best fight coming up this weekend on UFC Paris? Um, odds of that fight, Clayton Rodriguez is plus 260. Uh, Farid Basharat. Minus 325. And I know that those odds, you know, I know those odds are definitely steep in, in one way. And you're probably thinking, why the hell is Devin breaking down the first fight? The curtain jerker of this card. But I'm telling, I'm telling you guys, th this is a fight to watch. Um, sorry, I'm gonna adjust my camera one more time. This is a fight to watch, guys. Um, Farid Basharat, he is 10 and 0 one of the two Bashra brothers, and he might end up being the better one. We don't know yet. Javid is really, really good. But this dude, his last his last fight out, gets a decision win over Damon Blackshear. Nice, clean win on the Contender Series. And, you know, has some... A lot of a lot of rear naked chokes. He's definitely a rear naked choke guy. Um, not a big power puncher, but Farid Bashra is the definition of like an MMA native, a dude that just grew up fighting. He's just an MMA fighter. He can grapple. He can 
strike. He's not the fastest dude, not the most athletic dude. So definitely a very clean, straight puncher. Um, on the other hand, you have Clayton Rodriguez. And he, he's a guy that he came in off the contender series as well. Gets a gets an, a unanimous decision back in 2021. Loses, misses weight against CJ Vargara in a really, really close fight. Has CJ Vargara hurt multiple times. Um, CJ Vergara gets like two rounds of a lot of grappling control and, and ends up pulling that one out by a crotch hair. And then he goes out there and just he misses weight again and sh- freaking shits on Shannon Ross. He, he just goes down there and he goes, I'm going to go punch this guy really hard. He doesn't have the durability to hang with me. Um, Clayton's huge, man. Even though he's coming up from 125, like this dude is probably still going to be bigger than Farid. And he is such an explosive athlete. This is a guy that, like, if you're thinking about throwing Basharat on your parlay, if you're a, if you're a gambling person, and if you're a gambling person listening to the show, you're probably like, damn, Devin's wrong too much for me to be taking advice from him. But a guy like Clayton with his just athletic abilities, his speed, his power, especially up a weight class, um, couldn't can pose some threats to someone like Bashra. Um, Bashra can wrestle, and if you look at the fight with Clayton and, and CJ Vargara, that's where Vargara had his success. And Vargara is tiny, teeny tiny, tiny compared to Clayton. And if 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 Bashra can get the same entries, he might be able to nullify this and he might make this fight also look really easy. As long as this fight's on the feet, Bashrat is definitely the cleaner dude. I, I could see him, you know, going two or even three to one on volume against someone like Clayton. Um, but again, Clay, Clayton's athletic abilities, his speed, his power, his spinning butt punch in the Shannon Ross fight, if you go look at it, he he threw an ass strike at, at Shannon Ross. <laughs> um He's just like a whirling dervish of athleticism and speed. And he's like a true athletic 125er that just can't make weight. And 125 has got to be the hardest weight class to make, um, especially if you look at the dude. He is, again, he's freaking ginormous. Um, my pick is Bosch right here. I'm going to go with him because I think he can just wrestle. Um, even if he – we've never seen Bosch rot hurt. Again, that's also because he only has one fight in the UFC. It was against Damon Blackshear. Damon Blackshear is very, very good. He just lost. He beat Mario Bautista. Um, Mario Bautista, who is a very, very highly touted uh, bantamweight. Bantamweights are great, too. Like, this is... If you take two dudes... Like, if you take a dude with Basharat's skills and ability, and you just make him a middleweight, like, the dude's probably a top 15. Like, Basharat's just as good at MMA as Brendan Allen, you know, from the outside looking in, but yeah, bantamweights are dope. And, and I, I wanted to uh, just completely skip the middle segment of the show to give you guys a bonus fight. Um, I might do that every once in a while, change it around. If you like it, tell me if you don't tell me. Um, we got the St. Denny versus Tiago Moises. And I don't, when I'm doing my tape studies and, and my, you know, looking through notes and, and looking through records and, and all that shit, um, I don't pull the odds until the, I'm going to stop pulling the odds. And I typically don't pull the odds until like right before I do the show. Sometimes I'll do like my write up or I'll outline the show the, the day before I record, but I'm going to really start not pulling the odds until I sit down and start recording because I don't want the odds to F with me. If I, Think about the fight. I the way I try to break down a fight is I see the two fighters and I immediately think who I think is going to win, and then I will try to convince myself that that's right, or I will try to convince myself that that's wrong, and then in doing that, that's kind of how I get to to where I am. Um, and right away before I pull the odds on this, I was like, Saint Denis is going to be an underdog. Tiago Moises is he's he's UFC vet at this point. Um, but Saint Denis is the favorite. The Wasain Saint Denis is a minus one fifty five favorite. Tiago Moise is a plus one thirty dog. Um, if this were a boxing match, this would be a very close line. But in MMA, that kind of 
you know, not a big favorite, but he, he's a favorite. Um, Tiago Moises is coming off that pretty nice win against uh, Melky Costa, that, and that might end up being something better than it is. Again, that was up a weight class. Melky has since fought at 45 and looked very effing good. Um, prior to that, that, that rear naked choke against Giagos. Christos Giagos is a guy that's just... Christos Giagos might stick around and, and lose two fights and then win one emphatically, but he's not very good. Um, Joel Alvarez is another guy like... Tiago Moises' loss to Joel Alvarez told me a lot about him because Joel Alvarez has like a 0% takedown defense in the UFC, and I'm not kidding. Like, you can go and look that up. Um, and Tiago Moises is, he's an American top team dude that has low output striking, very high level BJJ, and, and he's a pretty good top side grappler. Like, that's his that's his game. He likes to top side grapple. Um, he if, he if he can scramble well, he can take your back, he, you know, like his rear naked choke, but just getting walked down and hit with elbows and just bludgeoned on the feet by Joel Alvarez. That was kind of a red flag for me. I'm going to remove his loss to Islam because that just doesn't matter. Um, his fight with, with, Oh, excuse me. His fight with Alexander Hernandez. Um, yeah, whatever. Alexander Hernandez. Um, the Bobby green fight. I thought, Tiago Moises, I thought he lost that fight. Um, and then the fight with Michael Johnson, like he was getting pieced up really bad and Michael Johnson made one mistake and, and it was a Michael Johnson fight. That's just how Michael Johnson loses fights. The fight against Demir Ismagulov, that fight back, it was even though it was in 2019, um, he still lost it via decision. He's lost against Benel Dariush. He has beaten Kurt Hollibaugh, which, like, the way that Kurt Hollibaugh looked a couple weekends ago, I would love to see them run that back, and I think I might almost pick that um, win, lose, or draw here. I would love to see a, a rematch between Kurt Hollibaugh and Tiago Moises. Um, moving on to Benoit, God of War, St. Denis. 11 wins, one loss. His, his loss came um, via absolute shit-kicking by... Lesio Deleski Dos Santos. I just botched that name. Capuera Dos Santos back in 2021. That was up a weight class. He came in on short notice and he got shit kicked. And I did not think he was ever going to ever amount to anything. Um, prior to that, he's, you know, wins in Brave FC. A lot of submissions. That's his thing. He can, he can you know, hurt people. His submission rear naked choke against Nick Nicholas Stolse was very nice. His, his knockout win over Gabriel Miranda. That was nice. But his most impressive win definitely was his, his win, that face crank to Ishmael Bonfim. Bonfim was a big favorite in that fight, coming off of a very impressive performance against Terrence McKinney, kind of causing, uh, we, we love Terrence here on this show. Check the kick, we love Terrence, but he like face planted Terrence, um, jumped knee, crushed him, crushed him with the boxing. And um, this fight showed me that, or that fight showed me that St. Denny, number one, he's a dog. He is so, so, so tough. He can take so much punishment, but he's a really good topside grappler. He's a good athlete. He's big and strong. And he knew that he did not want to have a striking match with Bonfim. He struck in the moments that he needed to, but he was able to take Bonfim down and really impose his will and get that face crank on him. And it looked very painful. Bonfim fought with anger and emotion in that fight. And I think, I think, um, St. Denis was able to stay calm and, and show even under fire that he was able to, you know, withstand whatever Bonfim had and, and go down and get the takedown. I think in a fight like this, I'm going to pick St. Denis. I think in a fight like this, I think he can strike with Moises' low output striking. I think he can grapple with Moises. I think he's going to be bigger and stronger. I think if Moises gets on top, he needs to get to a hip and get out of there. Um, he's just tougher than Moises, too. Like, the way that Moises went out in that Joel Alvarez fight, that happened to St. Denis times three up a weight class against Capuera dos Santos, and he just took that shit. 
like Saint Denis a G. The dude has fought in the French Special Forces. There's a really dope video compilation thing that he put together on his Instagram page. You guys should go look at it. It's like a it's a it's an American army song, whatever military song, and it shows him like with his family and his you know French military uniform and them fighting in the UFC. This dude's poor parents, man. Like, imagine your son, you know, is a special forces guy, goes back, and you're like, okay, I finally got my kid back. And he's like, no, mom, now I'm going to go be a UFC fighter, which is probably more dangerous. Um, St. Denny is dope, man. He, he's on a run here. He's got three wins in a row. Um, last one, impressive. All of them are by finish, too. All of them, you know, happen in the first seven and a half minutes of fighting, too. Uh, and if he wins this, this is a... Moises is a semi he's not a big name but beating someone like Moises like Moises doesn't lose he doesn't really lose to scrubs like Benio Dariush, Islam Mahashev, Joel Alvarez those are dudes that aren't scrubs and I, I think St. Denis is I think St. Denis is just as good or better than Joel Alvarez so we will see um, damn good fight though and, and if he wins, Paris is going to explode. Um, and and he, he's going to be one of the, the bigger names. I mean, the top three fights are all French fighters that are all pretty big names. But St. Denis is a dude that fought for them, like literally was part of their military. Um, so I would not be surprised if he gets a giant pop. Moving on to the co-main event, UFC Paris. We have Thug, Rose, Namajunas moving up a weight class to fight Manon, what is it, the Beast, Yoro. And um, odds are Manon is, is a minus 185 favorite. Thug Rose coming back at plus 154. I don't know if this fight should be closer. Um, the Rose that showed up and fought against Carla Esparza in their second fight should be like a 4-1 to one underdog against Manon Firo. Um, the Rose that showed up to fight Zhang Weili in their second fight, or even Jessica Andrade in their second fight, or Yoani on Jacek in their second fight, should be dead pick them. Um, Rose Namajunas has got that same thing that Khalil Roundtree has, where they're just like absolute world beaters absolute killers but if they don't have their head screwed on straight they are going to just bad things are going to happen to them um rose should 10 out of 10 times rose should beat carla esparza in a fight like every single time and was it 2021 when that fight happened um 2022 sorry may 7th of 2022 by the way this fight is is available on espn plus um that fight, that fight should be deleted from history, especially since the fight after that was Gaethje versus Oliveira, which was just a fucking crazy ass fight. Um, yeah, Rose and Esparza should be deleted from history, but I did not watch that in tape study for this. I refuse to. Um, the two fights prior to that were her knocking out um, Zhang Wei Li and then getting that splitty over her in the second fight, which was a very close fight beautifully fought by both women um she's got that that knockout slam loss to jessica andrage but she came back and and want to want to split the decision against andrage that was andrage in 2022 not the andrage of today i mean uh, you could go through rose's record one at a time there's no need to though if you're here you know who the hell she is um Rose has great footwork. She's great in the pocket. She's great at setting up her strikes with no tell. She's got a great shot. She's a good wrestler. She's got good submissions. She's even good off her back. When Rose is firing on all cylinders, she's an extremely well-rounded MMA fighter. She's good in the pocket. Look how she knocked out you want a young Jay chick in their first fight. She's also tough as nails in her, in her second fight with Yoana. It's really, really close on the scorecards could have been two and two. And then in the, in the last round closing the round, she gets that takedown and just fucking, you know, 
snatches the rug from under Yoana and, and seals that fight down. She again, you know, went to her wrestling to beat Zhang Wei Li. Um in the pocket, able to face a power puncher like Andraj and, and have moments and really use her jab to, you know, break up Andraja striking. Someone like Manon Furo. Um, Manon Furo is, is definitely she's got a very weird frame. Like she's built like a sh- like a shoebox, you know, where like she's got a very long torso, doesn't have the longest arms. She's definitely big though. She's huge. She's ripped up. Um and I believe she's like the number one contender in that fight. Her most, her best win is probably her win over Myra Bueno Silva, even though Myra Bueno Silva just popped for like Adderall or some shit over Holly Holm. Um, the knockout against Tabitha Ritchie. Tabitha Ritchie took that fight on short notice. It was her debut. Tabitha Ritchie is like an Adam weight. And she, yeah, there was like two or three weight classes in between them. Um, but her, her win against Jennifer Maya was probably closer than it should have been. Jennifer Maya actually has looked better since then. Um, it, Manon Firo can cruise. And she didn't cruise to a win against Chikagian. She didn't cruise to a win against Jennifer Maya. Um, she should be able to bully rose in the clinch rose is definitely a fighter that again it just depends on what rose shows up because you can bully rose you can get in there you can push her around um rose has done some interviews as of late and she's looked bigger and she said in these recent interviews also that you know she didn't think she was going to ever fight again but god told her this was her mission you know that whole thing and that really raises red flags for me because like, that's what happened to Rory McDonald. When Rory McDonald started talking like that, he started losing fights and now he doesn't fight anymore at all. Um, again, the dude also, you know, was the red King and had all those crazy wars, but man, is is a good boxer. That's her thing. She had a previous boxing career prior to this. And I'm not going to call her wins against Jennifer Maya and Caitlin Chikagi and Amara Buonasova like nobodies. But at the same time, you know, she hasn't gone out there and beat Tyler Santos or even like Aaron Blanchfield or something like that. If she were to go out there and beat one of those girls, um, I would maybe think a little bit differently of her. But Jessica Andrade went out there and, you know, knocked out Chikagian and Jennifer Maya is super tough. Jennifer Maya, in my opinion, is probably the best win, even the one, even compared to the Mara Buena Silva win. Um, I really flipped and flopped on this. And I have said some negative things about Rose in personal conversations with friends um, based off of where I think she's at. And especially, you know, if, if you remove that Carla Esparza fight, like it should just be fucking deleted forever. But if you were to remove that fight, these odds would be a lot different. If it was just the Zhang Wei Li, then okay, I'm moving up. I'm relinquishing my title, whatever. I'm I'm gone. I'm gonna go move up to 125. Um, I would feel a lot more confident in picking Rose. And it's really weird. Like for Rose, I don't know where. I don't know if she's like, hey, I need some money. I still got a fight on my contract. I can pick a fight because I know she's friends of Valentina. But maybe she thinks Valentina is going to lose. If if Rose beats Manon Fioro, regardless of the outcome, it's Rose Namunez, probably the best straw weight ever, if not one of them, one of the three. Um, if Rose goes out there and beats Manon Fioro, regardless of the outcome, she's getting the title shot over everyone. She's she's jumping everyone. Um, a smart better would pick Manon Fioro but I'm not going to gamble on this fight. I think I'm going to pick Rose. And I'm probably going to come back on here and eat so much crow and look like such a fucking idiot. Um, But Rose has always had power. Manon Firo is going to be willing to get in the pocket with her. Rose Rose has better footwork, and she's a better striker than Manon Firo. She really is. When Rose... Like, look... Yeah, Rose is just a better striker than Firo. Like, I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about their technique. I'm thinking about their footwork. 
if Rose goes out there and and sticks a jab on her, can mix in her kicks, can avoid the power coming back from Manon. Manon will will punch in combinations, and when when Manon wants to go for it, she can. Um, Rose may be bigger and may be able to mix in her wrestling too. The only only concern I have for Rose is she was never the most physical person, and she was able to be kind of. She's never the strongest girl at 115, but shit, she was getting takedowns and stuff against Zhang Wei Li, and look at Zhang Wei Li. I mean, with every performance Zhang Wei Li has, those wins for Rose look better and better. <sighs> I'm going to pick Rose. Give me Rose and I'm a Yunus, underdog, plus 154. I know for a fact Mano Furo is going to show up because she knows if she gets a win over Rose... If she were to go out there and stop Rose, immediate title shot, shoot her to the top. I'm going with Thug Rose, guys. Might might hate myself for it later, um, but I I'm gonna count on Rose showing up in the right headspace. She has more tools in her toolbox, more tools in her shed, and I think she just has more skills to rely on. Um, yeah, Rose is just the better technician. Rose Namajunas, give it to me. Moving on to the final fight on the card. UFC France, UFC Perry. Spivak versus Ciro Gan. Um, the second Spivak, sorry, the second Sergei um, in the top five or top ten of the UFC, wherever he's got in the UFC rankings. Um, and Ciro Bongamin Gan, just the... The guy with all the gifts. He's the guy with all the athletic gifts. He's just such an athletic monster. Um, the odds on this fight make sense. Um, Spivak, his his entry to the UFC and his fights prior to the UFC, like the dude beat Tony Lopez. Like, yeah. Cool. Beat Travis Fulton. Cool. That really told me absolutely nothing about him. Um, and then he comes to the UFC, debuts against Walt Harris, and just gets fucking killed in the first round in 50 seconds. Came back and actually got a submission. Arm triangle choke over Tai Tuivasa and then lost a decision to Taibura. Um Beat Jared Vanderaw. Eh, he's not in the UFC and he's moved to 205. No, Jared Vanderaw looks strange as a 205er. The Carlos Felipe. Carlos Felipe is out on PEDs. Um, the win over against Alexio Linick was was pretty decent at 21. That step in elbow loss to Aspinall. Um, that's just Tom Aspinall. And Tom Aspinall might be the best heavyweight on the planet. Um, knocked out Greg Hardy. He's our hero for that. Um, knocked out Sakai. And then the most eye-opening performance for, for Spivak for me personally was number one, watching his body transform and him really, really become a confident grappler. There was a clip of him um, kind of just playing around with John Jones and he looked bigger than Jones um, or at least similar size. He's got to be a smooth 248, 252, something around there in damn good shape. And that arm triangle choke finish he got over Derek Lewis was just a multitude of, you know, belly to back suplexes. He threw Derek Lewis all around the octagon and that was pre abs, Derek Lewis. Um, no one's done that to Derek Lewis. Like he turned him into a pretzel, balled him up and fucking threw him around. Like it was no one's business for him to have the strength to pick up and throw Lewis around. Lewis is a guy that as a, he doesn't have the best takedown defense, but a damn good get-up game. And just like Matt returns over and over and over again, throwing him around like he he big brother Derek Lewis. And no one's just – people have knocked out Derek Lewis. People have beat Derek Lewis, but no one's really, you know, picked him up and thrown him around. Um, Ciro Ghana is just like an MMA, you know, prodigy. He really truly is. And he's a guy that in between camps, um, he's – said that he's not training seriously, things of that nature. I really hope he's training seriously now because, number one, he's probably getting paid some good coin. 
Um, number two, he's a fun fighter. And number three, he's in the fucking UFC, so he needs to stop playing around. Um, he went on a hell of a streak. A hell of a streak getting into the UFC. Rafael Pessoa, arm triangle choke. Gets that, j- jumps into a heel hook submission of Dante Mays. Beats Tanner Bozier. That, the JDS fight was definitely like a, you know, a big moment for him. Um, his fight with Rosen strike was really bad. I did not tape study that fight for this, but like he, I mean, he nullified Rosen strike. It was a terrible fight. Didn't take any damage. Didn't really give any either. The win against Volkov. That's a good win. Um, his knockout against Derek Lewis was for the title down in Houston. Derek Lewis really shit the bed. His fight with Ngannou was a, I vividly remember this fight because I had COVID really bad. I was sick as shit and I was doing a little bit of sports betting at that time. And I think I put like a hundred or 150 bucks on Francis um, money line straight. And Francis went out there with two bad knees and two knee pads on and went out there and out wrestled this dude. Um, Francis could not catch him on the feet at all. Francis did have two bum knees. He's definitely the better athlete than Francis. Like if you, you know, told them to, 100 yard race or some sort of triathlon or something he's he beats francis every day um but francis was able to take him down and control him knocked out tied to ivasa that was a great a great win by him but then he goes out there and you know kind of gets folded in half by john jones quite literally john jones was able to enter the john jones is very fast and has beautiful injuries and beautiful timing and he's john fucking jones but he just ducked the punch got him into a body lock forced to scramble and kind of pancaked on top of Sirogan and then guillotined him. And the choke is like, you're like, is it over? Is it in? It's over. John Jones is a UFC heavyweight champ now. Um, Sergey Spivak does like a lot of body lock style takedowns and he will need to be very, very careful entering the pocket and trying to just smush the space in between them because Cyril Gaunt is very athletic and can do the same things on the feet that someone like Tom Aspinall can do. You know, if Spivak kind of gets ahead of his skis and tries to enter the pocket, I could really see Cyril Gaunt, you know, blasting him with a similar elbow. And I guarantee, you know, uh, Fernand Lopez and his team will be looking for shit like that. Um, Sirogan is definitely the faster dude. He's got better footwork. But over five rounds, Sirogan just has major grappling deficiencies. And number one, having a wrestling base is great in MMA. But being like a true heavyweight wrestler, shit, not even, like, not even, man, looking at Derek Lewis, like, just the way he threw him around was just so impressive. Um, why is his name escaping me right now? Um, oh my gosh. Curtis Blades. Um, like not even Curtis Blades could get in on takedowns. And, and the instant he wanted to take Derek Lewis down, he got hit with that uppercut. I just don't see... Zero gone is a guy that does have does have pretty low volume. And if he hurts you, he will swarm you. Will he hit you in the back of the head with punches? If you let him, if you turn, if you, if you get hurt and you slip in front of zero gone, zero gone will unload with volume, but I'm going to pick the underdog here. I'm going to pick Spivak to take down zero gone. Um, it m- it, it's probably going to look like the Francis and Ganu fight, but the last two rounds of the Francis and Ganu fight with more threats of submissions. Like Spiva has, Spiva has a really good um, head and arm triangle choke. Like that's something he is very good at. And he's bigger, he's stronger. Um, and I just don't know how serious Zero Gone is. You know, the last two dudes that went out there and wanted to wrestle him could and could do it pretty easily when they had to turn to it. Yes, one of them was John Jones, and yes, one of them is Francis Ngannou. But neither one of those two dudes, like, John Jones hasn't been a wrestler in a very long time, and Francis Ngannou hasn't wrestled anyone 
besides Zero Gone. Spivak, that's his game. Spivak wants to come out. He wants to wrestle you. He wants to get top control. That's what he's good at over five rounds. Does he leave openings in his striking? Is he going to be slower? Can he get crushed by an elbow or or even just Zero Gone? Could Zero Gone just jab him to death? Maybe. Um, but I'm going to go with another upset pick. Give me Sergey Spivak to win a third round by another arm triangle. I think he's going to be able to get on top of Gon. Gon did not have a lot of answers. He made that mistake against Francis Ngannou in their fight. Yeah, I mean, and the French crowd's going to be real quiet because they're all going to be there to see Cyril Gon. But I think they'll have enough good moments with uh, all the other French fighters and Benoit Saint Denis and maybe Menon Firo. Um, but I think Spivak is going to silence the French crowd and really show that he is a, a problem and a potential contender um, at heavyweight. That Tom Aspinall loss will forever be looming. But I, I you know, I think Sir, I think Cyril Gaon is just plateaued as well. I just have not seen the improvements. And this fight can be, you know, the moment where he shows us that he has improved. But Spivak has improved. He's changed his phys- he's changed his body. He's taken MMA seriously. He's younger, and that boy can wrestle. Give me Spivak as the underdog. Um, that's it, guys. That's it for the show. Check the Kick Podcast, SureDog.com. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the fights. <laughs>